Welcome to episode 45 of Model Steam Engine's Top Tip Time. This series features a wealth of very interesting and useful tips. This is a twin cylinder Bassett Lok steam engine running on the bench. And once I put the timing right, it runs very well. And here, by holding my finger against the flywheel, I can gauge how powerful it is and what the timing's like. This is more or less as I first got the engine. And now I've done quite a bit of work on the plant, it's looking a lot better. And it's working a lot better too. The steam test on the boiler was successful, so I can put it into service with confidence. And even though the safety valve's blowing off, the pressure gauge remains at a constant level. Over now to the small water pump. Although it worked okay, I didn't like the inlet union, it was a bit of a special size. So I drilled out the casting to 7 seconds of an inch, which is tapping size for quarter by 40. Then using a quarter by 40 tap, I threaded the hole to take one of these commercial unions like this. Then I thought, instead of this commercial union, maybe I should just put this piece of pipe on like this. But then I thought, no, it's going to stick over the edge of the baseboard. Instead, I used a PM Research Union. I buy these from time to time from a company in England called Forest Classics. The details of these elbows are on screen at the moment. PM Research are an American company and make some really nice things. In this clip, I'm making the exhaust collector. And for this, I'm using a piece of brass bar and in the current clip on screen, I'm marking out the holes. And these are at one inch centers to accept the outlet pipes from the cylinders. So I cut it to size, and now I'm drilling the cross holes in it. These holes are at one inch centers, and the first thing I would always do is use a center drill. I could have used a center punch, but there's no point. I can get the position perfectly using a center drill in the drilling machine. Once again, a lot of practice and the calibrated eye does come in useful. After drilling the pilot holes in the piece of bar, it's time to put it in the lathe to face off each end. I'm doing this job in the larger of my two lathes. This is my old Smart and Brown lathe, and this lathe is fitted with a four-jaw self-centering chuck, a very useful thing for turning square section material, as well as round material, but not too good for hexagon. So for hexagon and round material, I often use the small Boxford lathe at the other side of the workshop. After drilling a pilot hole with a centre drill, I then put a drill through the centre which is 7 seconds of an inch in diameter. And I don't want to drill all the way through this piece of metal, that's why I drilled the pilot holes first, because you can hear when the drill breaks through the pilot hole. I heard it break through the first one, and I've just heard it break through the second one, the tone changes. That stops me accidentally going all the way through. Here I'm using a quarter by 40 threads per inch taper tap, I'm threading the first three eighths of an inch of this hole to accept a union. I often use the lathe under power for tapping, but I'm running the lathe at a slower speed to do this. The next job, and the final job in the lathe, is to turn the piece of bar round and face across the end of it. You'll notice that the lathe is now running fast again for this operation. Some viewers will also notice the small pip on the end of the work. This means that the centre height of the tool is incorrect. It should be a little bit higher. But unlike one viewer who made a comment, I do not work to a tenth of a thou. That would be a little bit excessive. This is definitely not a high precision component. I'll be cleaning it up on the belt sander so it will be fine as it is. You will notice that the drill grabbed as it broke through into the centre hole. You have to be careful about this. You can damage the drill or snap the drill, but not in this case, it worked okay. Most of the time, twist drills will tend to grab as the drill emerges through the other end of the piece of metal. And this is particularly bad in brass and copper. It's terrible drilling copper. After finishing the drilling and cleaning up the piece of brass using my belt sander, I then soft soldered the collector to the end of the original exhaust pipes. Soft solder is sufficient for exhaust collectors. It's not good on steam inlets. You must never use soft solder for any high pressure live steam lines because the temperature of the steam will melt the solder. That's okay for small steam toys that run at 15 pounds per square inch, but for larger high pressure models, you must use silver solder on the live steam inputs. As shown here, I used another PM Research elbow to screw into the end of the exhaust collector. And to fit the elbow onto the exhaust collector, I just made a simple piece of threaded tube quarter by 40. And now it looks like this. I think I like the effect really. It's a square exhaust collector because the base of the engine, the modified base of the engine, is also pretty square, so they sort of match. 
and I have the option of rotating the exhaust elbow, either leaving it like this, turning it upwards, or turning it down should I need to pipe the exhaust through the baseboard. At the beginning of this video, I mentioned a surprise. No, I'm not going to set fire to myself. Here's the surprise. The engine originally came with this generator, and this was painted by a 12-year-old boy, apparently, who's now in his 50s. I think it's a good idea to lubricate the engine, because this engine spent quite a lot of time in a bath of cellulose thinners, or lacquer thinner if you live in the USA. You may notice that I've refitted some oil cups. Originally, there was only one oil cup fitted, and it was a really big lump of a thing. I was going to copy the original and just make another one, but it didn't look good to start with. In this sequence of video clips, as you can see, I really am going over the top with the oiling, because it's very dry indeed. I'm making sure that I miss none of the working parts. The silicone rubber o-ring that I originally fitted to the filler cap of the displacement lubricator was not a good fit, it was far too big. So now I'm fitting a smaller one. The problem with silicone o-rings is if they are too big and you put too much pressure on the filler cap, the o-ring squeezes out of the side, but this one won't, it's a perfectly good fit. It's time now to refit the cylinder cladding that I painted a while back, and I started off with the centerpiece that covers the two pieces of pipe, but then I realised, no, this has to go on afterwards. The design of the cylinder cladding for this engine is quite well thought out. What it's made out of is some sort of quite springy steel, I don't think it's mild steel, it's very springy, and it just snaps into place. But unfortunately, the centre part, which takes this small cover, is not really the right size and shape, and there's a bit of a gap and it looks horrible. I'll deal with that very shortly. It's time now to fit the cylinder covers. Well, the cylinder covers are already fitted, the proper ones. These are cylinder cover covers, and they're actually called domes of silence. And research tells me, or should I say viewers on YouTube tell me, that these are designed to be fastened to the bottom of furniture so that the furniture slides about more easily on the carpet. But in this case, the doubling as cylinder covers. And they had quite a nice look to this small engine. Originally, the cylinder cladding was in a bit of a state. At the end of this video, I show the engine running as I first received it. This is a quarter by 40 union nut fitted to the pipe. I modified this because the original thread arrangement was damaged and I thought it was a better idea to use commercial fittings. I'm removing this union nut and also the union nut and union cone on top of the boiler, the one on the tap, because I'm going to silver solder a pipe into these two parts and join them together. There's a slotted area in the top of the cast iron base of the boiler which needs to accept the pipe. The pipe goes through this slot and down through the fire and then out of the bottom and goes to the steam engine. I need this tap to have the steam union pointing towards me. And no, that's wrong. I'm doing this by fitting shim washers, different thicknesses of washers, until the tap ends up in the right position. And after about five or six attempts at using different permutations of different thickness of shim washers, I got it in the right position. Then I removed the union nut and the union cone, went into the outer part of the workshop, which was very cold, and silver soldered it together, and you can see here the end product. What you can't see in this clip is the other end of the pipe, which is just sticking out of the bottom of the boiler about six inches. The first thing to do is to tighten the union nut, then I know that this part of the pipe is going to be in this position, and then all I had to do was turn the boiler on its side and manually bend the other end of the pipe, after which I silver soldered the union cone onto the other end of the steam pipe, not forgetting to put the union nut onto the pipe first. So what am I going to do about all these gaps between the steam cylinders with the cladding? I decided to just use some Humbrol black enamel and painted them. But the cylinder cladding looked horrible, it really did look really bad. So then I wiped it off with a cloth. And after a few applications of paint and wiping the paint off, the cylinder cladding started to look okay. This cladding was very rusty before I took it off the engine and cleaned it all up, but it's never going to be a perfect smooth finish. I didn't want to keep overspraying it because you build up such a thick coating of paint, if it ever gets chipped it looks really bad. 
To be perfectly honest, this cast iron boiler casing is a little bit rough. It's a rough casting. I can see now when Stuart adapted this design, they used sheet metal for the sides. It's a better idea. So in this clip, while I've got the tin of black paint open and a brush full of it, I'm taking the opportunity to touch up some of the paint on the boiler casing itself, not forgetting to paint the screw heads of these 4BA countersunk bolts at one end and the 4BA cheese head bolts at the other end. When rebuilding engines, putting them back together once they've been painted, whether the steam locomotives or stationary engines, can be quite a nerve-wracking job, because inevitably some damage is going to occur, usually where the nuts meet the paintwork if you're not using washers, or even if you're using washers, you can still get damage to the paint. So this is just the way it is, and you get used to it. It's a bit of a pain, and when you're touching in these parts, it's really important to make sure you don't get paint all over the rest of the area around the part being painted. Unless, of course, the area around the part being painted also needs touching up. So what is there left to do now to complete this plant? I have a baseboard, which is not quite big enough, so I'm probably going to make another one, or better still, put some thick mahogany around this one, which will take it to the right size. And at this stage, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank Terry, who was one of my viewers, who dropped me in a suitcase full of really top-quality mahogany. You'll see me using this stuff fairly frequently for quite a lot of jobs during the rebuilding of steam engines, steam locomotives, and even steam boats. Just as a before and after comparison, this is the engine when I first got it running, and as you can see, it was in a bit of a state. And now it looks considerably better than this, and it still runs just as well. I think it's time to put it all together now on a nice baseboard. Stay safe, stay healthy, thanks for watching and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my Mainsteam Models website and click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that you can find other videos that you may like to watch. And by using the playlists you can actually watch the videos back to back.